Please note that today's episode includes sexual references. The new culture war raging across America is over books. According to the New York Times, the pace at which groups of parents and officials and lawmakers are challenging books in school libraries has reached a speed that many haven't seen in decades. More than 30 book challenges nationwide. Parents and school officials banning books at an unprecedented rate. People out there that would like to see those books before we burn them. According to PEN America, bans are up 33 percent across the country. Statewide laws have been passed to pull what's on the shelves in public libraries and public schools. Jobs have been lost. Educators have been threatened. The graduate students that I work with who are teaching, they tell me stories of their day-to-day work life these days that are different than anything I experienced. This is Adam Lotz, a historian and college professor. But he's also taught in public schools, and he knows the ins and outs of the issues those teachers face. It's the same tensions, but it's like all cranked up to 11. The tensions have always been there about, well, gosh, you know, if I teach this book and it has this sex part in it, is some parent going to get mad about that? Like, that's always been there. I think these days, though, it's kind of like the difference between going to a family dinner. Say you're going to the big Thanksgiving dinner. Every year, you know of all these same tensions in the family. Those tensions have always been there. I think the moment that we're in right now, though, is that moment at the sort of middle end of the dinner when everyone's had too much to drink and somebody said the thing out loud in accusing tones and maybe even threw a glass on the ground. You know, it's gotten scary and everybody knew the tension going in. But right now we're all just kind of staring at each other, fingers crossed, hoping that the responsible adults in the room will find a way to work this out peacefully. But honestly, not sure that they will, because some years it doesn't end that way. Some years it ends with family brawls. And so I think that's the situation right now. It's it's always tense. For 100 years, it's been tense. But right now it's beyond tense. It's a scary time. Tensions are high and physical violence doesn't seem out of the question. Florida had to cover up their bookshelves for fear of getting sanctioned or fired over the books that were in circulation. There are from both book sides after Governor Pritzker made Illinois the first state in America to essentially ban media book bans. Is running with a story about a Florida school banning a poem. But as it turns out, it's not banned at all. To the poem two two titles 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 from the library school shelves. board meeting in Dearborn with six books at the center of the conflict for have LGBTQ themes. Hearing the headlines has made me feel like everything is coming to a head, like civility and discourse are a thing of the past. It can feel like things are worse than ever. Which led me to ask, is this true? Has America faced moments like this before? Welcome back to Missing Pages. I'm your host, writer and literary critic, Beth Ann Patrick. This is the podcast where we examine some of the most surprising, industry-shaking controversies in the literary world and try to make sense of them. This is the first episode in a series covering recent bans and violence that we've seen in the literary world. Today is part one of a two-parter on book bans. Next week, we're going to talk to the people who have been directly affected. But today, we're going to put the practice of book banning into historical context. Chapter One, We've Been Here Before. My name is Gillian Trank. I'm a historian of religion and sexuality, and I am the co-host of the Sexing History Podcast. Why are we talking to a professor whose expertise is in religion and sexuality on an episode about book bans? I'm sure, to the surprise of no one, the two are inextricably related. When we talk about book bans now, we are most frequently talking about public schools and public libraries, taxpayer-funded institutions. But America has a long history of book banning that informs the conversation today. So before we move on to school bans, we are speaking with historian Gillian Frank about the grandfather of bannings. All right. So Anthony Comstock was 
the former postmaster general of the United States. He was a devoutly religious Protestant. And if you look at the pictures of him, he was a man with like this giant sort of mutton chop beard. He was a fierce in public about his moral convictions. He was outspoken in his denunciation of all sorts of vices. He was what we would call right now, we would say generously, deeply devout. Others would accuse him of being a moral fanatic. He was obsessed with those who disagreed with him. In the late 19th century, Comstock sought power, and while he had his detractors, he had fans. He was good at networking. He was part of a larger set of networks of folks who were involved in various forms of purity campaigns. America was changing. It was industrializing. Immigrants were turning up at the shores and moving into the cities. And when society is changing, traditional values feel threatened, even back in the 19th century. Maybe even especially in the 19th century. You know, those Victorians. And he was part of a larger network of people who were concerned about the morality of the populace and believed that it was the role, not just of churches, but of the state to make sure that the population had temptations removed from it. He called uh, obscenities traps for the young. The idea was that young people were blank slates. They were profoundly impressionable, that they could be easily corrupted and that by being exposed to lewd images, to sexualized representations, to mass culture and books and notions that might somehow indoctrinate them, they would be forever turned deviant. And therefore, these, what he called traps for the young, must be removed from the streets, from plain sight, collected, and outright banned. In the words of the great American classic, Think of the children. Won't somebody please think of the children? But why was Comstock so obsessed with the corruption of children? Why was he so sure Americans were being ruined by moral decay? He was a compulsive masturbator. This appeared repeatedly in his diaries. When we talk about masturbation, we have to understand that in that particular era, it was fraught with a different set of meanings. In the 19th century, it was quite literally associated not only with sin, it's called the deadly vice. It was seen as a form of moral decay and uh, might actually, they believe, cause physical harm. People believed that diseases associated with masturbating could decompose the human body. Comstock was of a generation that literally believed that masturbation could kill, if not your soul, then your body. Say what you want about the impact of the laws named after Comstock, but he was genuinely worried about saving the lives of the masses. He knew his weaknesses and was worried about everyone else succumbing. He was incapable of self-governance, and therefore the surest way to assure moral purity was to remove the objects of temptation. In 1873 and 1909, laws were passed to remove such temptations. The Comstock laws, which are named after him, basically were both federal and existed on the state level, and they were all-encompassing. These laws attempted to regulate what could be represented in print, visually, and also to make criminal the advertisement of and dissemination of devices that would interrupt pregnancies, whether that was a contraceptive, or to enable abortion. So it was fairly wide-ranging. Think about what is included in all temptations. That's everything from education on contraception to anything that might tantalize a reader. How the heck do you enforce that? Through the post office. From 1873 to 1907, Comstock was a special agent of the U.S. Postal Service, which may seem like an odd choice. But think about what power that gives him. What he did was he systematized it. And that systematization happened through the province of the post office. What it basically did was it did it on a federal level and made using the U.S. Post Office uh, as a means to distribute these materials, a crime. The post office could and would investigate and charge people with trying to distribute all the things Comstock worried would corrupt the nation. Comstock personally arrested a feminist author who argued women should have rights over their own bodies. And he arrested someone who received the book in the mail. Remember, this is almost a century and a half ago. 
all of the items that concern Comstock would need to be printed on paper. Aside from going door to door, the only way to distribute this kind of printed information, whether it was about contraception or something else the Postmaster General deemed improper, was to go through the post office. What we saw was quite literally a regime that was trying to create an information chokehold. Talk about big government infringing upon the lives of its citizens. But as the years went by, paying for the post office to inspect pieces of mail at such a level went out of vogue. But the laws stayed on the books, and what's offensive adapts with the time. The goal is to give the state, to give regulators, to give those who are on the side of controlling sexual expression, controlling reproductive freedom, a multi-tool. The power of it is not in the precision, it's the part of it is in the vagueness, right? Increasingly, as you see the rise of gay and lesbian communities, really starting in the 19th century through the rise of cities, gay magazines, gay film. The Comstock laws were used to stop the spread of these materials, even when they weren't sexual or graphic. Just being gay positive was enough to be obscene. They weren't initially planned to target gay people, right? The sort of notion that there was sort of a homosexual community, as they would have called it in the day, or a lesbian community, that was an alien thing to Comstock. And so what we see is this sort of expansive capacity to enforce sexual and social norms as they're defined and as they change over time. It establishes a governing order for sexuality. This wide brush, it banned all sorts of materials from magazines to literature. For instance, D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover and James Joyce's Ulysses. Whatever caught the eye of government workers or Christian activists or local police could and would be brought up on obscenity charges. The impacts of these laws have affected some of the great works of American literature. And if we're thinking in the 1950s, we can look at Allen Ginsberg in the Howell trial, which was brought up on obscenity charges. And some of the reasons among them were, the fact that it had explicit words, but this was, Howell and other poems, was explicitly pro-gay. Or purgatory their torsos night after night with dreams, with drugs, with waking nightmares, alcohol and cock and endless balls. So the logic of Howell's obscene, you know, it was offensive at the time by virtue of the fact that it was unabashedly and affirmatively, you know, queer, affirmed communism, didn't disavow it at the height of the Red Scare and the Lavender Menace of the 50s. This was a book that was like proudly both. In 1957, officials seized the book and released a statement saying, you wouldn't want your children to come across it. Months later, a bookstore manager sold a copy to an undercover cop and was arrested and jailed. A trial ensued. It captured the attention of the press and literati. In the end, a judge ruled that the poem held redeeming social importance. This was a turning point, which led to books like Lady Chatterley's Lover, to be made available after a nearly 30-year ban, and Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer. As the decades go by, obscenity charges on a national level have tended to fail. Famously, attempts at banning offensive music only led to the parental advisory stickers being put on CDs, which in my experience as a parent was basically a flag for my kids to want the CD more. Anyways, now the law states a work has to be utterly without serious value in order for something to be banned, which is certainly a higher bar, but can still lead to expensive and high-stress situations for small business owners or school libraries that carry works activists find offensive. So it's a fight that continues, and simultaneously there's another battle that goes on and on. What should be taught in public education? What books should be stocked in public and school libraries? As we know, this is where the battle really lies today. Has this fight ever been as intense as it is now? That's after the break. Chapter 2. Losing Touch with Nuance. My name is Adam Lotz. I'm a professor of education and history at uh, Binghamton University, State University of New York in upstate New York. Professor Lotz is the man we heard up top, whose Thanksgiving dinner sometimes results in brawls. Suffice to say, Lotz isn't the cliché, stuffy historian type. 
And one of the professors said, well, you know, if you're thinking about teaching high school or you're thinking about, you know, doing a PhD, you should teach high school or middle school if you like history and you like fart jokes. And I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Lotz has been working at the University of Binghamton for nearly two decades. His research has focused on the history of book bans, but he still makes time for his other passions. But I still get to work in high school and middle school classrooms, and I get to hear the fart jokes still. It's just the greatest job. Clearly, Lotz loves teaching, even though he had to deal with upset parents over what's okay and not okay to teach middle schoolers and high schoolers. Lots of groups on both the right and the left have been book banners. For, gosh, 50 years now, books like Huck Finn have come under pressure from the left because it includes this, you know, horrible racial language, you know, about Black people, Indigenous people. And so from the left, groups have said, hey, our kids shouldn't be exposed to that. So sometimes you hear this, you know, like both sides kind of approach. Depending on your perspective, what is and isn't appropriate to teach a child will change. But according to Lotz, for nearly 100 years, one ideology has been pushing the issue, setting us on a course we keep perpetuating. I take it to the 1920s. That is sort of the fault line in U.S. history. And when it comes to school culture wars, the, the ways that Americans are fighting right now, the sides, those sides were defined in the 1920s. Who started it exactly? Well, in the 1920s, this is one that gets people uh, uh, very nervous. Uh, I think justifiably, we, Americans don't like to talk about this group. But in the 1920s, there was a clear later of this kind of book banning, this kind we're still seeing today. And that group was the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan is alive and well in America today. Today, we imagine a terrorist group that society at large has rejected. But back in the Roaring Twenties, that wasn't the case. It wasn't just a Southern thing. It was a huge thing. The Ku Klux Klan in the 20s ran the state of Indiana. They ran the state of Oregon. Uh, right here in upstate New York, they held these huge ceremonies on Lookout Hill, where I, where I am right now, where they, they naturalized citizens. They were violent and they were racist, but they weren't uh, the same. Their biggest parades in Washington, D.C., they didn't wear their hoods. They were proud to be members of this group back then. And they were ferocious book banners and book controllers. The Klan was prominent across America. Their reach even extended into the classroom. So in the 1920s, and we could do this in the, you know, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, you can pick a decade. But the name that they called themselves were the women of the Ku Klux Klan. They would conduct whispering campaigns in local communities where they would talk about what any local teacher was teaching. And they reserved to themselves the right physically to go into the school, inspect the books, and to accuse teachers of teaching ideas that weren't up to sort of their idea of what made traditional American vows, which again, it's the Klan. So their idea of traditional American values was very strangled and stunted. Not surprisingly, English wasn't the only department the Klan took issue with. There was a famous American history textbook written by a nationally known scholar, David Saville Muzzy, that the Klan wanted to replace. So they wrote their own textbook. The Klan textbook from the 1920s, it said that slavery, the big problem with slavery, was that it brought a bunch of Black people to America and imposed a burden on white people. I say that again. The Klan version from 1920 said that insisted every kid in America should understand race. Every kid in America should understand the bad, the, the terrible nature of slavery and that the worst thing about slavery was that poor white people were forced to dish out welfare for the black people who had come to this country by slavery. And when people read this at the time, they realized just how hateful the Klan was and they recycled all of the Klan's textbooks and used it as mulch to make non-segregated community gardens. I'm kidding, sadly. The racism against Black people wasn't what upset most people. So you take people like Catholic Irish immigrants, we're just, I mean, they wouldn't say this, but the, the implication was anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism sort of defines white America at the time. But it was a struggle for groups like Catholic, especially Catholic Irish, but also Catholic, Catholic Germans, Catholic Polish, to be included in this sort of white American history. The Klan textbook was a failure, fortunately. So on a grassroots level, there was a fight over what we should teach kids, 
which is similar to our current moment. But one thing we are seeing now is mayors, governors, presidential candidates campaigning and focusing on what's taught in schools. I was curious if prominent politicians were interested in book banning in schools all those decades ago. So in the 1930s, you got a guy that doesn't get remembered a lot except by historians. But in the in the 1920s and 30s, he's very famous because he's trying to be very famous. His name is Thomas L. Blanton. He's a congressman from the great state of Texas. And in, the, in 1935, he thinks he's riding this wave of school paranoia. You know, this sort of end of the family dinner anxiety that happens. You know, he thinks he's going to get um, accolades. Uh, back then, the U.S. Congress controlled uh, Washington, D.C. public schools. And Blanton snuck in what he called the Little Red Rider. Blanton passed along that D.C. teachers at, at, could not talk about communism, even outside of work. So inside school, outside of school, if you were a teacher in D.C., you weren't allowed to talk about communism and you had to come pick up your paycheck every two weeks and swear an oath that you had not done so. And this was the law. The U.S. Congress passed this law. So teachers in the 1930s said, wait, like, how can I teach kids anything if I can't talk about communism? And again, this is 1935 when there was communism. So all the way back in the 1930s, you had opportunistic politicians trying to rile people up by turning public education into a fight. And lots told me you also had the media playing the same songs as today. Obviously, there's no Internet in 1940, but there is Forbes magazine. And the, the man who founded Forbes magazine, Bertie Forbes, he was telling people, take over your local school boards because these local school boards are sneaking in all this anti-American stuff. And so Forbes magazine was a sort of influencer of the day. Forbes was particularly focused on a history textbook whose main author was Harold Rugg and was referred to as the Rugg's textbook. They taught that the U.S. was not, by definition, the only good country on the planet. They taught kids that the U.S. had a history of, of racial strife, of class strife. They even tried to turn classrooms into a more democratic structure where teachers wouldn't be the only authority. And in the end of the 1930s, literally while Nazis are burning books in Europe, these books become accused of being subversive, anti-American, anti-white, anti-Christian, and they are yanked from, from millions of sold copies to, I mean, an unmeasurable number. They just you couldn't sell them. And, and in some places, Marshfield, Wisconsin, Binghamton, New York, they made bonfires of these history books. KKK history books. Politicians in Congress making teachers swear to not speak about communism. Book burnings. Instead of feeling like now is worse than ever, I started to wonder how we ever made our way out. But of course, these people don't represent everyone. In Binghamton, New York, a group of parents were outraged about the Ruggs textbook and the superintendent spoke up. The school superintendent, Daniel Kelly, said, I love these books. I use these books. I read these books to my children. Kelly went to the school board and said, has anyone here besides me, has anyone here read these books? And they all said no. But we hear that they're socialists. We hear that they're subversive. And we can't take that risk. We got if they if they might be dangerous, we got to get rid of them for the sake of the children. And Daniel Kelly said, if you want to get rid of them, fine, we'll get rid of them. I'm not going to fight with you about that because you seem so angry and you haven't read the books and I'm not going to die on this hill. Instead, Superintendent Daniel Kelly just ordered new textbooks, ones that were very similar. And that's what gives me hope. The adults in the room, people like Superintendent Kelly today are saying schools are going to do what they we've always done which is find ways to do what's best for the children. Even when some people in the community are running around doing things that they're claiming are for the children, but are really dangerous for the children. So this moment we're in now, it's similar to the 20s and 30s. I wasn't too encouraged to learn that, considering the world wars we saw in those decades. But lots assured me America has gone through moments like those in the 20s and 30s, like today. People like Ronald Reagan made their name in California, standing up for a very stunted curriculum. Uh, and in fact, against uh, books like Land of the Free, 
which was a tech history textbook. Again, super similar to 1619 Project, a history textbook that purportedly was going to include more non-white voices, especially black voices. Ronald Reagan makes a national name for himself as a culture warrior, specifically about what history to teach in the great state of California. This scary, turbulent moment, according to Lotz, it's been like this many times before. But why does it keep coming up time and again? It's a chronic condition because the United States has never been able to figure out its pronouns. The United States cannot define who we are and who they are. And a bunch of different groups for a hundred years have tried to insist that our group counts as part of the American us. That's the problem. And it's always been a problem, a chronic condition that comes out during periods of stress, like say a global pandemic, like say a particularly turbulent presidency, these stressors, this huge cultural tumult, you know, like what does America mean? Take your pick. When you're living in history, it's easy to forget we are part of history. And America is no stranger to turbulence. The 1950s, we have, you know, anti-communism and McCarthyism. The 1960s, the name of the decade even means political culture war. So no matter where you look, it's a chronic condition that America doesn't know how to define itself. And it, we can kind of muddle along. But when it comes to what the schools are supposed to teach, so, suddenly we have to say, hey, wait, you know, what do the kids need to know? And then suddenly we have to define it. We can't. And we being the United States, the United States can't tell kids who we are because we literally don't agree. America has been through hard times before. Those times stress our conflicting identity crisis. Right now, we are certainly feeling the effects. But in the 70s, one town saw blood spilled over textbooks. Does an elementary teacher have the right to challenge that child's belief in God, cause him to doubt that there is a God? That's after the break. Chapter 3. From Printed Page to Bloodstained Streets. It was Willa Cather, the author, who in 1936... She named it. She heard the famous quote, the world broke apart in 1922 or thereabouts, meaning this sense of, of a divided culture that can't agree on what books are right for children, who represent the canon of what kids should read. That has, for a, as a through line, been it's about literally who kids are becoming. If the pressure, um, the pressure point, the reason for these ferocious culture wars in schools is because... America doesn't know what to tell children about what defines America. Literature is the thing in schools that is supposed to have helped children to do that. To pick just one episode, it was the mid-1970s, and it was literally explosive. Her name was Alice Moore, and, and sadly, she just passed away. She was a really a sweet and generous person, but she was also an ardent conservative activist. And she ran, took over a school board in 1974, Kanawha County, West Virginia. Moore took her position on the school board seriously and went through the textbooks they were voting to approve. And she took real issue with the new literature textbooks. The school board was just kind of passing it through. Clearly, the chairman uh, expected this to be a very boring school board meeting. All in favor? All opposed? You know, just going through the motions, but clearly expecting he would have five you know, unanimous five in favor. But then you hear uh, Alice Moore saying, well, now, wait a minute. Has anyone looked really closely at these books? Because I have. And they include literature like E.E. E. Cummings. I like my body when it is with your body. I like your body. I like what it does. I like its hows. I like to feel the spine of your body and its bones and the trembling, firm smoothness in which I will again and again and again, kiss. Which she thought was too sexual for kids. It includes a Lawrence Ferlinghetti poem. You know, he was one of the beats. The poem that it included was Christ Climbed Down. Christ climbed down from his bare tree this year and ran away to where no intrepid Bible salesman covered the territory in two-tone Cadillacs and where no Sears Roebuck crutches, complete with plastic babe in manger arrived by parcel post and if you read the poem, I think a Christian would say, I'm not much of a Christian, but a Christian would say, actually, this is a very Christian poem because it says that Christ 
would look sourly upon the bad things people have done in his name. It included bits from Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice, you know, his prison memoir. He's a black militant. I had planned to run for president of the United States. My slogan? Put a black finger on the nuclear trigger. 400 years of docility, of being calm, cool, and collected under stress and strain would go to prove that I was the man for the job. Even a celebrity at the time got caught in the crosshairs. There was an excerpt from Evil Knievel's memoir. It included bits from his memoir where he talks about being a kid, taking, this is the word he used, taking goofballs and running away from cops. I don't know what a goofball is exactly, like pharmaceutically. But Alice Moore, the conservative mom at the center of this, didn't want her kids knowing about goofballs or any of the text lots mentioned above. So she made her case against the textbook. Alice Moore in 1974 said, this literature is not going to raise a new generation of American kids. It's anti-Christian. It's anti-patriotic. It's pro-drug. It's anti-white. It's everything bad. And we're not just allowing kids to read it. We're giving it to them in school and saying that this counts as your culture. Read it. Learn it. This is you. It got real ugly real fast. Moore didn't have enough votes to ban the textbook, so she helped organize a boycott till the school removed it. And things got out of hand fast. Mr. Cleaver, in his poetry, obviously thinks it is beautiful to rape people. After a three-hour debate on June 27, 1974, the board approved the books, and in response, Moore and her supporters staged a boycott. 45,000 elementary school students were kept home. Miners, bus drivers, and trucking workers joined the boycott. They dynamite bombed the school district headquarters. They firebombed elementary schools. Thankfully, the bombing happened at night, so no one was hurt. But this wasn't the only act of violence over these textbooks. They formed picket lines. Two people got shot, not killed. So school buses uh, were sniped, you know, with rifle fire. Cop cars shot. The superintendent moved his family out of town. For people in Kanawha County, when they sent you a death threat, you had to take that serious. He didn't sleep in the same place two nights in a row. All of this over textbooks. The White House, the Ford administration got involved. The White House sent out a, an official statement after the school district headquarters had been dynamite bombed. The White House sent out a formal statement in support of the boycott, in support of the side that had bombed the school district headquarters. After nearly five months, the battle petered out. In the end, the county came back to what the school district had proposed in the first place. You don't like the book, let's do this. We don't want to keep the old textbooks, we need new textbooks. But we'll have whatever books are the most sort of con controversial, parents will have to sign a permission slip. Two people are shot, buildings are bombed, it's a mess, and finally they come back and say, okay, that's what we'll do. Partly it's because it became clear that the boycotters, even in a conservative area like Kanawha County, West Virginia, were in the minority. The biggest march was in favor of the books, and it was led by high school students. So it fizzled. And you ended up exactly at the same place we had been before the boycott. It's just that everyone was a lot angrier and the teachers were a lot more frightened and the teaching was a lot more watered down. I can't even imagine what that must have been like for the teachers or the students. With all this in mind, I started to wonder how bad is this moment? If it's always been an issue that's ebbed and flowed. What should we think about this culture war as it continues into a third century? I hate to say that this isn't a as bad as it gets because the kinds of things we're seeing now, and this I say more as a teacher and a parent than as a historian, but when I see students who are you know, afraid to express uh, their identity, uh, when I see students who feel like the state is, like the government is somehow against them, you know, as, as a gay kid, as a black kid, it's hard enough to be 17 years old, ever. Uh, but to be in a school and to have the governor of your state either imply or stay straight out that 
you don't somehow count as much as a fully person as some other kinds of kids in that school, that's as bad as it gets. But, on the other hand... Having said that, uh, it's, numbers-wise, it's been worse. In the 50s, if you ask teachers in New York City in, in 1953, they were fired in fistfuls. Between 1948 and 1953, 250 teachers were forced out because of concerns that they were communist or had communist sympathies. So they had no autonomy to, they tried, they sued. And that's one of the reasons we know about it as historians is because they put their evaluations, their annual evaluations in the court records to prove that they were good teachers and got fired anyway. But they were accused of being subversive and so they were fired. So they weren't able to push back uh, successfully. They lost their jobs and again, one even lost their life. Starting in the late 40s and lasting over a decade, teachers in New York were subject to investigations trying to determine their loyalty to the country. Minnie Gutride was one of the teachers subjected to this. She was accused of attending communist meetings nearly a decade earlier. Two days after being interrogated, she died by suicide. I'd like to imagine, and I feel confident, that at least today, Gutride would have supporters and resources to help her. I didn't think I'd say this when we started researching the episodes on book bans, but I'm at least grateful that the culture war this time around, at least so far, has been a cold war, that buildings haven't been blown up, that protesters haven't been shot. It's cold comfort, I know. And it doesn't change the fact that the situation today is still dire. Next week, we talk to those directly affected. Missing Pages is a podglomerate original produced, mixed, and mastered by Chris Boniello with additional production and editing by Jordan Aaron. This episode was produced by Claire McInerney. This episode was written by Lauren Delisle. Additional production and writing by Grant Irving. Fact-checking by Douglas Weissman. Marketing by Joni Deutsch, Madison Richards, Morgan Swift, Vanessa Ullman, and Annabella Pena. Art by Tom Grillo. Produced and hosted by me, Beth Ann Patrick. Original music composed and performed by Hashem Asadullahi. Additional music provided by Epidemic Sound. Executive produced by Jeff Umbro and The Podglomerate. Special thanks to Dan Christo, Matt Keeley, Adam Lotz, Gillian Frank, Casey Meehan, Deborah Caldwell-Stone, Len Niehoff, and Alexandra Stevenson. You can learn more about Missing Pages at thepodglomerate.com, on Twitter at Miss Pages Pod, and on Instagram at Missing Pages Pod, or you can email us at Missing Pages at thepodglomerate.com. If you liked what you heard today, please let your friends and family know and suggest an episode for them to listen to. 